Part 5. Legal Ethics Rule 135. Powers and Duties of Courts and Judicial Officers Section 1. Courts of Justice shall always be open, except on legal holidays, for the filing of any pleading, motion or other papers, for the trial of cases, hearing of motions, and for the issuance of orders or renditions of judgments. Justice shall be impartially administered, without unnecessary delay. Section 2. The sitting of every court of justice shall be public, but any court may, in its discretion, exclude the public when the evidence to be adduced is of such nature as to require their exclusion in the interest of morality or decency. The records of every court of justice shall be public records, and shall be available for the inspection of any interested person, at all proper business hours under the supervision of the clerk, having custody of such records, unless the court shall, in any special case, have forbidden their publicity in the interest of morality or decency. Section 3. Process issued from a superior court in which a case is pending to bring in a defendant or for the arrest of any accused person or to execute any order or judgment of the court may be enforced in any part of the Philippines. Section 4. The process of inferior courts shall be enforceable within the province where the municipality or city lies. It shall not be served outside the boundaries of the province in which they are comprised, except with the approval of the judge of first instance of said province, and only in the following cases. Paragraph A. When an order for the delivery of personal property lying outside the province is to be complied with. Paragraph B. When an attachment of real or personal property lying outside the province is to be made. Paragraph C. When the action is against two or more defendants residing in different provinces. And Paragraph D. When the place where the case has been brought is not specified in a contract in writing between the parties or is the place of the execution of such contract as appears therefrom. Writs of execution issued by inferior courts may be enforced in any part of the Philippines without any previous approval of the judge of first instance. Criminal process may be issued by a justice of the peace or other inferior court to be served outside his province when the district judge or in his absence the provincial fiscal shall certify that in his opinion the interests of justice require such service. Section 5. Every court shall have power. Paragraph A. To preserve and enforce order in its immediate presence. Paragraph B. To enforce order in proceedings before it, or before a person or persons empowered to conduct a judicial investigation under its authority. Paragraph C. To compel obedience to its judgments, orders, and processes and to the lawful orders of a judge out of court in a case pending therein. Paragraph D. To control, in furtherance of justice, the conduct of its ministerial officers and of all other persons in any manner connected with a case before it, in every manner appertaining thereto. Paragraph E. To compel the attendance of persons to testify in a case pending therein. Paragraph F. To administer or cause to be administered oaths in a case pending therein, and in all other cases where it may be necessary in the exercise of its powers. Paragraph G. To amend and control its process in orders so as to make them conformable to law and justice. Paragraph H. To authorize a copy of a lost or destroyed pleading or other paper to be filed and used instead of the original, and to restore and supply deficiencies in its records and proceedings. Section 6. When by law, jurisdiction is conferred on a court or judicial officer, all auxiliary writs, processes, and other means necessary to carry it into effect may be employed by such court or officer. And if the procedure to be followed in the exercise of such jurisdiction 
is not specifically pointed out by law or by these rules. Any suitable process or mode of proceeding may be adopted, which appears conformable to the spirit of said law or rules. Section 7. All trials upon the merits shall be conducted in open court, and so far as convenient in a regular courtroom. All other acts or proceedings may be done or conducted by a judge in chambers, without the attendance of the clerk or other court officials. Section 8. A judge of first instance shall have power to hear and determine, when within the district, though without his province, any interlocutory motion, or issue after due and reasonable notice to the parties, on the filing of a petition for the writ of habeas corpus, or for release upon bail or reduction of bail in any court of first instance, the hearings may be had at any place in the judicial district which the judge shall deem convenient. Section 9. Whenever a judge, appointed or assigned in any province or branch of a court of first instance in a province, shall leave the province by transfer or assignment to another court of equal jurisdiction, or by expiration of his temporary assignment, without having decided the case totally heard by him, and which was argued, or an opportunity given for argument to the parties or their counsel, it shall be lawful for him to prepare and sign his decision in said case anywhere within the Philippines. He shall send the same by registered mail to the clerk of the court where the case was heard or argued to be filed therein, as of the date when the same was received by the clerk, in the same manner as if he had been present in court to direct the filing of the judgment. If a case has been heard only in part, the Supreme Court, upon petition of any of the parties to the case, and the recommendation of the respective district judge may also authorize the judge who has partly heard the case, if no other judge had heard the case in part, to continue hearing and to decide said case, notwithstanding his transfer or appointment to another court of equal jurisdiction. Rule 136 Court Record and General Duties of Clerks and Stenographers Section 1 The arms and great seal of the Supreme Court are these Arms Paleways of two pieces, azure and gules Superimposed, a balance or center With two tablets containing the commandments of God Or on either side Chief Argent With three mullets Or equidistant from each other In point of honor Avoid argent over all the sun, rayonant or with eight major and minor rays. The great seal of the Supreme Court shall be circular in form, with the arms as described in the last preceding paragraph, in a scroll argent with the following inscription, Lex Populusque, and surrounding the whole, a garland of laurel leaves, in or, around the garland, the text, Supreme Court, Republic of the Philippines. The arms and seal of the Court of Appeals shall be the same as that of the Supreme Court, with the only difference that in the seal shall bear around the garland the text, Court of Appeals, Republic of the Philippines. The arms and seal of the Court of First Instance shall be the same as that of the Supreme Court, with the only difference that the seal shall bear around the garland the text, Court of First Instance. The name of the province, Republic of the Philippines. Section 2. Process shall be under the seal of the court from which it issues. Be styled, Republic of the Philippines, province or city of blank. To be signed by the clerk and bear date the day it actually issued. Section 3. The clerk's office with the clerk or his deputy in attendance shall be open during business hours on all days, except Sundays and legal holidays. The clerk of the Supreme Court and that of the Court of Appeals shall keep office at Manila, and all papers authorized or required to be filed therein shall be filed at Manila. Section 4. The clerk of a superior court shall issue under the seal of the court all ordinary writs and process, incident to pending cases, the issuance of which does not involve the exercise of functions appertaining to the court or judge only, 
and may, under the direction of the court or judge, make out and sign letters of administration, appointments of guardians, trustees, and receivers, and all writs and process issuing from the court. Section 5. In the absence of the judge, the clerk may perform all the duties of the judge in receiving applications, petitions, inventories, reports, and the issuance of all orders and notices that follow as a matter of course under these rules, and may also, when directed so to do by the judge, receive the accounts of executors, administrators, guardians, trustees, and receivers, and all evidence relating to them, or to the settlement of the estates of deceased persons, or to guardianships, trusteeships, or receiverships, and forthwith transmit such reports, accounts, and evidence to the judge, together with his findings in relation to the same, if the judge shall direct him to make findings, and include the same in his report. Section 6. The clerk of each superior court shall receive and file all pleadings and other papers properly presented, endorsing on each such paper the time when it was filed, and shall attend all of the sessions of the court, and enter its proceedings for each day in a minute book to be kept by him. Section 7. The clerk shall safely keep all records, papers, files, exhibits, and public property committed to his charge, including the library of the court, and the seals and furniture belonging to his office. Section 8. The clerk shall keep a general docket, each page of which shall be numbered and prepared for receiving all the entries in a single case, and shall enter therein all cases, numbered consecutively in the order in which they were received, and, under the heading of each case, in the complete title thereof, the date of each paper, filed or issued, of each order or judgment entered, and of each other step taken in the case, so that by reference to a single page, the history of the case may be seen. Section 9. The clerk shall keep a judgment book, containing a copy of each judgment rendered by the court in order of its date, and a book of entries of judgments, containing at length, in chronological order, entries of all final judgments or orders of the court. Section 10. The clerk shall keep an execution book, in which he or his deputy shall record at length, in chronological order, each execution and the officers return thereon by virtue of which real property has been sold. Section 11. The clerk shall prepare for any person demanding the same, a copy certified under the seal of the court of any paper, record, order, judgment, or entry in his office, proper to be certified for the fees prescribed by these rules. Section 12. The clerk shall keep such other books and perform such other duties as the court may direct. Section 13. The general docket, judgment book, entries book, and execution book shall each be indexed in alphabetical order in the names of the parties and each of them. If the court so directs, the clerk shall keep two or more of either or all of the books and dockets above mentioned separating civil from criminal cases, or actions from special proceedings, or otherwise keeping cases separated by classes, as the court shall deem best. Section 14. No record shall be taken from the clerk's office without an order of the court, except as otherwise provided by these rules. However, the Solicitor General, or any of his assistants, the Provincial Fiscal or his deputy, and the attorneys de officio, shall be permitted upon proper receipt to withdraw from the clerk's office the record of any cases in which they are interested. Section 15. All unprinted documents presented to the Superior Court of the Philippines shall be written on paper of good quality, 12 and 3 eighths inches in length and 8 by 1 half inches in width, leaving a margin at the top and at the left-hand side not less than 1 inch and 1 half in width. Papel Catalan of the first and second classes, legal cap, and typewriting paper of such weight, as not to permit the writing of more than one original 
and two carbons at one time will be accepted, provided that such paper is of the required size and of good quality. Documents written with ink shall not be of more than 25 lines to one page. Typewritten documents shall be written double-spaced. One side only of the page will be written upon, and the different sheets shall be sewn together firmly by five stitches in the left-hand border in order to facilitate the formation of the expendiente, and they must not be doubled. Section 16. All papers required by these rules to be printed shall be printed with black ink on unglazed paper, with pages 6 inches in width by 9 inches in length in pamphlet form. The type used shall not be smaller than 12 points. The paper used shall be of sufficient weight to prevent the printing upon one side from being visible upon the other. Section 17. It shall be the duty of the stenographer who has attended a session of a court, either in the morning or in the afternoon, to deliver to the clerk of court, immediately at the close of such morning or afternoon session, all the notes he has taken, to be attached to the record of the case, and it shall likewise be the duty of the clerk to demand that the stenographer comply with said duty. The clerk of court shall stamp the date on which such notes are received by him. When such notes are transcribed, the transcript shall be delivered to the clerk, duly initialed on each page thereof, to be attached to the record of the case. Whenever requested by a party, any statement made by a judge of first instance, or by a commissioner with reference to a case being tried by him, or to any of the parties thereto, or to any witness or attorney, during the hearing of such case, shall be made of record in the stenographic notes. Section 18. Every municipal and city judge shall keep a well-bound book, labeled Docket, in which he shall enter for each case. Paragraph A. The title of the case including the names of all the parties. Paragraph B. The nature of the case whether civil or criminal, and if the latter, the offense charged. Paragraph C. The date of issuing preliminary and intermediate process, including orders of arrest and subpoenas, and the date and nature of the return thereon. Paragraph D. The date of the appearance or default of the defendant. Paragraph E. The date of presenting the plea, answer, or motion to quash and the nature of the same. Paragraph F. The minutes of the trial, including the date thereof, and of all adjournments. Paragraph G. The names and addresses of all witnesses. Paragraph H. The date and nature of the judgment, and in a civil case, the relief granted. Paragraph I. An itemized statement of the costs. Paragraph J. The date of any execution issued and the date and contents of the return thereon. Paragraph K. The date of any notice of appeal filed and the name of the party filing the same. The municipal or city judge may keep two dockets, one for civil and one for criminal cases. He shall also keep all the pleadings and other papers and exhibits in cases pending in his court and shall certify Copies of his docket entries and other records proper to be certified for the fees prescribed by these rules. It shall not be necessary for the municipal or city judge to reduce to writing the testimony of witnesses, except that of the accused in preliminary investigation. Section 19. Entry on Docket of Inferior Courts And in front of all his entries in his docket, make and subscribe substantially the following entry. A docket of proceedings in cases before blank, municipal judge or city judge of the municipality or city of blank in the province of blank, Republic of the Philippines. Rule 137. Disqualification of Judicial Officers. Section 1. No judge or judicial officer shall sit in any case in which he or his wife or child is pecuniarily interested as heir, legatee, creditor, or otherwise, or in which he is related to either party, within the sixth degree of consanguinity or affinity, 
or to counsel within the fourth degree, computed according to the rules of the civil law, or in which he has been executor, administrator, guardian, trustee, or counsel, or in which he has presided in any inferior court when his ruling or decision is the subject of review, without the written consent of all parties in interest, signed by them and entered upon the record. A judge may, in the exercise of his sound discretion, disqualify himself from sitting in a case for just or valid reasons other than those mentioned above. Section 2. If it be claimed that an official is disqualified from sitting as above provided, the party objecting to his competency may, in writing, file with the official his objection stating the grounds therefore, and the official shall thereupon proceed with the trial or withdraw therefrom, in accordance with his determination of the question of his disqualification. His decision shall be forthwith made in writing, and filed with the other papers in the case, but no appeal or stay shall be allowed from, or by reason of, his decision in favor of his own competency until after final judgment of the case. Rule 138. Attorneys and Admission to Bar Section 1. Any person heretofore duly admitted as a member of the bar, or hereafter admitted as such in accordance with the provisions of this rule, and who is in good and regular standing, is entitled to practice law. Section 2. Every applicant for admission as a member of the bar must be a citizen of the Philippines, at least 21 years of age, of good moral character, and a resident of the Philippines and must produce before the Supreme Court satisfactory evidence of good moral character, and that no charges against him involving moral turpitude have been filed or are pending in any court in the Philippines. Section 3. Citizens of the United States of America, who before July 4, 1946, were duly licensed members of the Philippine Bar, in active practice in the courts of the Philippines, and in good and regular standing, as such may, upon satisfactory proof of those facts before the Supreme Court, be allowed to continue such practice after taking the following oath of office. I, state name, having been permitted to continue in the practice of law in the Philippines, do solemnly swear that I recognize the supreme authority of the Republic of the Philippines. I will support its constitution and obey the laws as well as the legal orders of the duly constituted authorities therein. I will do no falsehood, nor consent to the doing of any in court. I will not wittingly or willingly promote or sue any groundless, false, or unlawful suit, nor give aid nor consent to the same. I will delay no man for money or malice, and will conduct myself as a lawyer, according to the best of my knowledge and discretion, with all good fidelity, as well to the courts as to my clients." and I impose upon myself this voluntary obligation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. Section 4. Applicants for admission who, being Filipino citizens, are enrolled attorneys in good standing in the Supreme Court of the United States, or in any circuit court of appeals or district court therein, or in the highest court of any state or territory of the United States, and who can show by satisfactory certificates that they have practiced at least five years in any of said courts that such practice began before July 4, 1946, and that they have never been suspended or disbarred, may, in the discretion of the court, be admitted without examination. Section 5. All applicants for admission other than those referred to in the two preceding sections shall, before being admitted to the examination, satisfactorily show that they have regularly studied law for four years and successfully completed all prescribed courses in a law school or university officially approved and recognized by the Secretary of Education. The affidavit of the candidate accompanied by a certificate from the university or school of law shall be filed as evidence of such facts and further evidence may be required by the court. No applicant shall be admitted to the bar examinations unless he has satisfactorily completed the following courses in a law school or university duly recognized by the government. Civil law, commercial law, remedial law, 
criminal law, public and private international law, political law, labor and social legislation, medical jurisprudence, taxation, and legal ethics. Section 6. No applicant for admission to the bar examination shall be admitted unless he presents a certificate that he has satisfied the Secretary of Education that, before he began the study of law, he had pursued and satisfactorily completed in an authorized and recognized university or college requiring for admission thereto the completion of a four-year high school course, the course of study prescribed therein for a bachelor's degree in arts or sciences, with any of the following subjects as major or field of concentration, political science, logic, English, Spanish, history, and economics. Section 7. All applicants for admission shall file with a clerk of the Supreme Court the evidence required by Section 2 of this rule at least 15 days before the beginning of the examination. If not embraced within Sections 3 and 4 of this rule, they shall also file within the same period the affidavit and certificate required by Section 5. And if embraced within Sections 3 and 4, they shall exhibit a license evidencing the fact of their admission to practice, satisfactory evidence that the same has not been revoked, and certificates as to their professional standing. Applicants shall also file at the same time their own affidavits as to their age, residence, and citizenship. Section 8. Notice of applications for admission shall be published by the Clerk of the Supreme Court in newspapers published in Filipino, English, and Spanish for at least 10 days before the beginning of the examination. Section 9. Applicants not otherwise provided for in Sections 3 and 4 of this rule shall be subjected to examinations in the following subjects. Civil law, labor and social legislation, mercantile law, criminal law, political law, constitutional law, public corporations and public officers, international law, private and public, taxation, remedial law, civil procedure, criminal procedure and evidence, legal ethics and practical exercises, in pleading and conveyancing. Section 10. Persons taking the examination shall not bring papers, books, or notes into the examination rooms. The questions shall be the same for all examinees, and a copy thereof, in English or Spanish, shall be given to each examinee. Examinees shall answer the questions personally, without help from anyone. Upon verified application made by an examinee stating that his penmanship is so poor that it will be difficult to read his answers without much loss of time, the Supreme Court may allow such examinee to use a typewriter in answering the questions. Only noiseless typewriters shall be allowed to be used. The Committee of Bar Examiners shall take such precautions as are necessary to prevent the substitution of papers or commission of other frauds. Examinees shall not place their names on the examination papers. No oral examination shall be given. Section 11. Examinations for admission to the Bar of the Philippines shall take place annually in the city of Manila. They shall be held in four days to be designated by the Chairman of the Committee on Bar Examiners. The subjects shall be distributed as follows. First day, Political and International Law, Morning, and Labor and Social Legislation, Afternoon. Second day, Civil Law, Morning, and Taxation, Afternoon. Third day, Mercantile Law, Morning, and Criminal Law, Afternoon. Fourth day, Remedial Law, Morning, and Legal Ethics and Practical Exercises, Afternoon. Section 12. Examinations shall be conducted by a committee of bar examiners to be appointed by the Supreme Court. This committee shall be composed of a justice of the Supreme Court, who shall act as chairman, and who shall be designated by the court to serve for one year, and eight members of the bar of the Philippines, who shall hold office for a period of one year. The names of the members of this committee shall be published in each volume of the official reports. Section 13. No candidate shall endeavor to influence any member of the committee, 
and during examination, the candidates shall not communicate with each other, nor shall they give or receive any assistance. The candidate who violates this provision, or any other provision of this rule, shall be barred from the examination, and the same to count as a failure against him and further disciplinary action, including permanent disqualification, may be taken in the discretion of the court. Section 14. In order that the candidate may be deemed to have passed his examinations successfully, he must have obtained a general average of 75% in all subjects, without falling below 50% in any subject. In determining the average, the subjects in the examination shall be given the following relative weights. Civil law, 15%. Labor and social legislation, 10%. Mercantile law, 15%. Criminal law, 10%. Political and international law, 15%. Taxation, 10%. Remedial law, 20%. Legal ethics and practical exercises, 5%. Section 15. Not later than February 15th after the examination, or as soon thereafter as may be practicable, the committee shall file its report on the result of such examination. The examination papers and notes of the committee shall be filed with the clerk and may there be examined by the parties in interest after the court has approved the report. Section 16. Candidates who have failed the bar examinations for three times shall be disqualified from taking another examination unless they show to the satisfaction of the court that they have enrolled in and passed regular fourth-year review classes as well as attended a pre-bar review course in a recognized law school. The professors of the individual review subjects attended by the candidates under this rule shall certify under oath that the candidates have regularly attended classes and passed subjects under the same conditions as ordinary students and the ratings obtained by them in the particular subject. Section 17. An applicant who has passed the required examination or has been otherwise found to be entitled to admission to the bar, shall take and subscribe before the Supreme Court the corresponding oath of office. Section 18. The Supreme Court shall thereupon admit the applicant as a member of the bar for all the courts of the Philippines, and shall direct an order to be entered to that effect upon its records, and that the certificate of such record be given to him by the clerk of court, which certificate shall be his authority to practice. Section 19. The clerk of the Supreme Court shall keep a roll of all attorneys admitted to practice, which roll shall be signed by the person admitted when he receives his certificate. Section 20. It is the duty of an attorney, paragraph A, to maintain allegiance to the Republic of the Philippines and to support the Constitution and obey the laws of the Philippines. Paragraph B. To observe and maintain the respect due to the courts of justice and judicial officers. Paragraph C. To counsel or maintain such actions or proceedings only as appear to him to be just, and such defenses only as he believes to be honestly debatable under law. Paragraph D. To employ, for the purpose of maintaining the causes confided to him, such means only as are consistent with truth and honor and never seek to mislead a judge or any judicial officer by an artifice or false statement of fact or law. Paragraph E. To maintain inviolate the confidence and at every peril to himself to preserve the secrets of his client and to accept no compensation in connection with his client's business except from him or with his knowledge and approval. Paragraph F. To abstain from all offensive personality and to advance no fact prejudicial to the honor or reputation of a party or witness unless required by the justice of the cause with which he is charged. Paragraph G. Not to encourage either the commencement or the continuance of an action or proceeding, or delay any man's cause from any corrupt motive or interest. Paragraph H. Never to reject for any consideration personal to himself the cause of the defenseless or oppressed. Paragraph I. In the defense of a person accused of crime, by all fair and honorable means, regardless of his personal opinion as to the guilt of the accused, 
to present every defense that the law permits, to the end that no person may be deprived of life or liberty but by due process of law. Section 21. An attorney is presumed to be properly authorized to represent any cause in which he appears, and no written power of attorney is required to authorize him to appear in court for his client. But the presiding judge may, on motion of either party, and on reasonable grounds therefore being shown, require any attorney who assumes the right to appear in a case to produce or prove the authority under which he appears, and to disclose whenever pertinent to any issue the name of the person who employed him, and may thereupon make such order as justice requires. An attorney willfully appearing in court for a person without being employed unless by leave of the court, may be punished for contempt as an officer of the court who has misbehaved in his official transactions. Section 22. An attorney who appears de parte in a case before a lower court shall be presumed to continue representing his client on appeal unless he files a formal petition withdrawing his appearance in the appellate court. Section 23. Attorneys have authority to bind their clients in any case by any agreement in relation thereto, made in writing, and in taking appeals, and in all matters of ordinary judicial procedure. But they cannot, without special authority, compromise their client's litigation or receive anything in discharge of a client's claim but the full amount in cash. Section 24. An attorney shall be entitled to have and recover from his client no more than a reasonable compensation for his services, with a view to the importance of the subject matter of the controversy, the extent of the services rendered, and the professional standing of the attorney. No court shall be bound by the opinion of attorneys as expert witnesses as to the proper compensation, but may disregard such testimony and base its conclusion on its own professional knowledge. A written contract for services shall control the amount to be paid therefore, unless found by the court to be unconscionable or unreasonable. Section 25. When an attorney unjustly retains in his hands money of his client after it has been demanded, he may be punished for contempt as an officer of the court, who has misbehaved in his official transactions. But proceedings under this section shall not be a bar to a criminal prosecution. Section 26. An attorney may retire at any time from any action or special proceeding by the written consent of his client filed in court. He may also retire at any time from an action or special proceeding without the consent of his client, should the court on notice to the client and attorney, and on hearing, determine that he ought to be allowed to retire. In case of substitution, the name of the attorney newly employed shall be entered on the docket of the court in the place of the former one, and written notice of the change shall be given to the adverse party. A client may at any time dismiss his attorney or substitute another in his place, but if the contract between client and attorney has been reduced to writing, and the dismissal of the attorney was without justifiable cause, he shall be entitled to recover from the client the full compensation stipulated in his contract. However, the attorney may, in the discretion of the court, intervene in the case to protect his rights. For the payment of his compensation, the attorney shall have a lien upon all judgments for the payment of money and executions issued in pursuance of such judgment, rendered in the case wherein his services had been retained by the client. Section 27. A member of the bar may be disbarred or suspended from his office as attorney by the Supreme Court for any deceit, malpractice, or other gross misconduct in such office, grossly immoral conduct, or by reason of his conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude, or for any violation of the oath which he is required to take before admission to practice, or for a willful disobedience of any lawful order of a superior court, or for corruptly or willfully appearing as an attorney for a party to a case without authority to do so. The practicing of soliciting cases at law for the purpose of gain, either personally or through paid agents or brokers, constitutes malpractice. Section 28. The Court of Appeals or a Court of First Instance may suspend an attorney from practice for any of the reasons named in the last preceding section, and after such suspension, 
such attorney shall not practice his profession until further action of the Supreme Court in the premises. Section 29. Upon such suspension, the Court of Appeals or the Court of First Instance shall forthwith transmit to the Supreme Court a certified copy of the order of suspension and a full statement of the facts upon which the same was based. Upon receipt of such certified copy and statement, the Supreme Court shall make full investigation of the facts involved and make such order, revoking or extending the suspension or removing the attorney from his office as such as the facts warrant. Section 30. No attorney shall be removed or suspended from the practice of his profession until he has had full opportunity upon reasonable notice to answer the charges against him, to produce witnesses in his own behalf, and to be heard by himself or counsel. But if upon reasonable notice he fails to appear and answer the accusation, the court may proceed to determine the matter ex parte. Section 31. A court may assign an attorney to render professional aid free of charge to any party in a case if upon investigation it appears that the party is destitute and unable to employ an attorney and that the services of counsel are necessary to secure the ends of justice and to protect the rights of the party. It shall be the duty of the attorney so assigned to render the required service unless he is excused therefrom by the court for sufficient cause shown. Section 32. Subject to availability of funds as may be provided by law, the court may, in its discretion, order an attorney employed as counsel de officio to be compensated in such sum as the court may fix in accordance with Section 24 of this rule. Whenever such compensation is allowed, it shall not be less than 30 pesos in any case, nor more than the following amounts. 50 pesos in light felonies. 100 pesos in less grave felonies. 200 pesos in grave felonies other than capital offenses. 500 pesos in capital offenses. Section 33. Any official or other person appointed or designated in accordance with law to appear for the government of the Philippines shall have all the rights of a duly authorized member of the bar to appear in any case in which said government has an interest, direct or indirect. Section 34. In the court of a justice of the peace, a party may conduct his litigation in person with the aid of an agent or friend appointed by him for that purpose or with the aid of an attorney. In any other court, a party may conduct his litigation personally or by aid of an attorney, and his appearance must either be personal or by a duly authorized member of the bar. Section 35. No judge or other official or employee of the superior courts or of the office of the Solicitor General shall engage in private practice as a member of the bar or give professional advice to clients. Section 36. Experienced and impartial attorneys may be invited by the court to appear as amici curiae to help in the disposition of issues submitted to it. Section 37. An attorney shall have a lien upon the funds, documents, and papers of his client which have lawfully come into his possession and may retain the same until his lawful fees and disbursements have been paid and may apply such funds to the satisfaction thereof. He shall also have a lien to the same extent upon all judgments for the payment of money and executions issued in pursuance of such judgments, which he has secured in a litigation of his client, from and after the time when he shall have caused a statement of his claim of such lien to be entered upon the records of the court rendering such judgment, or issuing such execution, and shall have caused written notice thereof to be delivered to his client and to the adverse party. And he shall have the same right and power over such judgments and executions as his client would have to enforce his lien and secure the payment of his just fees and disbursements. Rule 138-A Law Student Practice Rule Section 1 A law student who has successfully completed his third year of the regular four-year prescribed law curriculum 
and is enrolled in a recognized law school's clinical legal education program, approved by the Supreme Court, may appear without compensation in any civil, criminal, or administrative case before any trial court, tribunal, board, or officer to represent indigent clients accepted by the legal clinic of the law school. Section 2. The appearance of the law student authorized by this rule shall be under the direct supervision and control by a member of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, duly accredited by the law school. Any and all pleadings, motions, briefs, memoranda, or other papers to be filed must be signed by the supervising attorney for in behalf of the legal clinic. Section 3. The rules safeguarding privileged communications between attorney and client shall apply to similar communications made to or received by the law student acting for the legal clinic. Section 4. The law student shall comply with the standards of professional conduct governing members of the bar. Failure of an attorney to provide adequate supervision of student practice may be a ground for disciplinary action. Rule 139. Disbarment or Suspension of Attorneys Section 1. Proceedings for the removal or suspension of attorneys may be taken by the Supreme Court on its own motion or upon the complaint under oath of another in writing. The complaint shall set out distinctly, clearly and concisely, the facts complained of, supported by affidavits, if any, of persons having personal knowledge of the facts therein, alleged and shall be accompanied with copies of such documents as may substantiate said facts. Section 2. If the complaint appears to merit action, a copy thereof shall be served upon the respondent, requiring him to answer the same within 10 days from the date of service. If the complaint does not merit action, or if the answer shows to the satisfaction of the Supreme Court that the complaint is not meritorious, the same shall be dismissed. Section 3. Upon the issues raised by the complaint and answer, or upon failure of the respondent to answer, the case shall be referred to the Solicitor General for investigation to determine if there is sufficient ground to proceed with a prosecution of the respondent. In the investigation conducted by the Solicitor General, the respondent shall be given full opportunity to defend himself, to produce witnesses in his own behalf, and to be heard by himself in counsel. However, if upon reasonable notice the respondent fails to appear, the investigation shall proceed ex parte. Section 4. Based upon the evidence adduced at the hearing, if the Solicitor General finds no sufficient ground to proceed against the respondent, he shall submit a report to the Supreme Court containing his findings of fact and conclusion, whereupon the respondent shall be exonerated unless the court orders differently. Section 5. If the Solicitor General finds sufficient ground to proceed against the respondent, he shall file the corresponding complaint accompanied with all the evidence introduced in his investigation with the Supreme Court, and the respondent shall be served by the clerk of the Supreme Court with a copy of the complaint with direction to answer the same within 15 days. Section 6. The evidence produced before the Solicitor General in his investigation may be considered by the Supreme Court in the final decision of the case, if the respondent had an opportunity to object and cross-examine. If in the respondent's answer, no statement is made as to any intention of introducing additional evidence, the case shall be set down for hearing. Upon the filing of such answer, or upon the expiration of the time to file the same. Section 7. Upon receipt of the respondent's answer, wherein a statement is made as to his desire to introduce additional evidence, the case shall be referred to a commissioner who, in the discretion of the court, may be the clerk of the Supreme Court, a judge of first instance, or an attorney at law for investigation, report, and recommendation. The Solicitor General or his representative shall appear before the commissioner to conduct the prosecution. The respondent shall be given full opportunity to defend himself, to produce additional evidence in his own behalf, and to be heard by himself and counsel. However, if upon reasonable notice the respondent fails to appear, the investigation shall proceed ex parte. 
the rules of evidence shall be applicable to proceedings of this nature. Section 8. Upon receipt of the report of the Commissioner, copies of which shall be furnished to the Solicitor General and the Respondent, the case shall be set down for hearing before the Court, following which the case shall be considered submitted to the Court of its final determination. Section 9. As far as may be applicable, the procedure above outlined shall likewise govern the filing and investigation of complaints against attorneys in the Court of Appeals or in Courts of First Instance. In case of suspension of the respondent, the Judge of First Instance or Justice of the Court of Appeals shall forthwith transmit to the Supreme Court a certified copy of the order of suspension and a full statement of the facts upon which same is based. Section 10. Proceedings against attorneys shall be private and confidential, except that the final order of the court shall be made public, as in other cases, coming before the court. Rule 139A Integrated Bar of the Philippines Section 1 There is hereby organized an official national body to be known as the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, composed of all persons whose names now appear or may hereafter be included in the role of attorneys of the Supreme Court. Section 2. The fundamental purposes of the integrated bar shall be to elevate the standards of the legal profession, improve the administration of justice, and enable the bar to discharge its public responsibility more effectively. Section 3. The Philippines is hereby divided into nine regions of the integrated bar. To wit, Paragraph A. Northern Luzon, consisting of the provinces of Abra, Batanes, Benguet, Cagayan, Ifugao, Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, Isabela, Kalinga Apayao, La Union, Mountain Province, Nueva Vizcaya, and Quirino. Paragraph B. Central Luzon, consisting of the provinces of Bataan, Bulacan, Nueva Ecija, Pampanga, Pangasinan, Tarlac, and Zambales. Paragraph C. Greater Manila, consisting of the city of Manila and Quezon City. Paragraph D. Southern Luzon, consisting of the provinces of Batangas, Cavite, Laguna, Marinduque, Occidental Mindoro, Oriental Mindoro, Quezon, and Rizal. Paragraph E. Bicolandia, consisting of the provinces of Albay, Camarines Norte, Camarines Sur, Catanduanes, Masbate, and Sorsogon. Paragraph F. Eastern Visayas, consisting of the provinces of Bohol, Cebu, Eastern Samar, Leyte, Northern Samar, Samar, and Southern Leyte. Paragraph G. Western Visayas, consisting of the provinces of Aklan, Antique, Capiz, Iloilo, Negros Occidental, Negros Oriental, Palawan, Romblon, and Sikihor. Paragraph H. Eastern Mindanao, consisting of the provinces of Agusan del Norte, Agusan del Sur, Bukidnon, Camigin, Davao del Norte, Davao del Sur, Davao Oriental, Misamis Oriental, Surigao del Norte, and Surigao del Sur. And, paragraph I, Western Mindanao, consisting of the cities of Basilan and Zamboanga, and the provinces of Cotabato, Lanao del Norte, Lanao del Sur, Misamis Occidental, South Cotabato, Sulu, Zamboanga del Norte, and Zamboanga del Sur. In the event of the creation of any new province, the Board of Governors shall, with the approval of the Supreme Court, Determine the region to which the said province shall belong. Section 4. A chapter of the integrated bar shall be organized in every province. Except as herein below provided, every city shall be considered part of the province within which it is geographically situated. A separate chapter shall be organized in each of the following political subdivisions or areas. Paragraph A. The sub-province of Aurora. Paragraph B. Each congressional district of the city of Manila. 
Paragraph C, Quezon City. Paragraph D, Caloocan City, Malabon and Navotas. Paragraph E, Pasay City, Makati, Mandaluyong, and San Juan del Monte. Paragraph F, Cebu City, and Paragraph G, Sambuanga City and Basilan City. Unless he otherwise registers his preference for a particular chapter, a lawyer shall be considered a member of the chapter of the province, city, political subdivision, or area where his office is, or in the absence thereof, his residence is located. In no case shall any lawyer be a member of more than one chapter. Each chapter shall have its own local government, as provided for by uniform rules, to be prescribed by the Board of Governors and approved by the Supreme Court, the provisions of Section 19 of this rule notwithstanding. Chapters belonging to the same region shall hold regional conventions on matters and problems of common concern. Section 5. The integrated bar shall have a House of Delegates of not more than 120 members who shall be apportioned among all the chapters as nearly as may be according to the number of their respective members, but each chapter shall have at least one delegate. On or before December 31, 1974, and every four years thereafter, the Board of Governors shall make an apportionment of delegates. The term of office of delegates shall begin on the date of the opening of the annual convention of the House, and shall end on the day immediately preceding the date of the opening of the next succeeding annual convention. No person may be a delegate for more than two terms. The House shall hold an annual convention at the call of the Board of Governors at any time during the month of April of each year for the election of governors, the reading and discussion of reports, including the annual report of the Board of Governors, the transaction of such other business as may be referred to it by the Board, and the consideration of such additional matters as may be requested in writing by at least 20 delegates. Special conventions of the House may be called by the Board of Governors to consider only such matters as the Board shall indicate. A majority of the delegates who have registered for a convention, whether annual or special, shall constitute a quorum to do business. Section 6. The Integrated Bar shall be governed by a board of governors. Nine governors shall be elected by the House of Delegates from the nine regions on the representation basis of one governor from each region. Each governor shall be chosen from a list of nominees submitted by the delegates from the region, provided that not more than one nominee shall come from any chapter. The president and executive vice president, if chosen by the governors from outside of themselves, as provided in Section 7 of this rule, shall ipso facto become members of the board. The members of the board shall hold office for a term of one year, from the date of their election and until their successors have been duly elected and qualified. No person may be a governor for more than two terms. The board shall meet regularly once every three months on such date and at such time and place as it shall designate. A majority of all the members of the board shall constitute a quorum to do business. Special meetings may be called by the president or by five members of the board. Subject to the approval of the Supreme Court, the board shall adopt bylaws and promulgate canons of professional responsibility for all members of the integrated bar. The bylaws and the canons may be amended by the Supreme Court motu proprio or upon the recommendation of the Board of Governors. The Board shall prescribe such other rules and regulations as may be necessary and proper to carry out the purposes of the integrated bar as well as the provisions of this rule. Section 7. The integrated bar shall have a President and an Executive Vice President who shall be chosen by the Governors immediately after the latter's election, either from among themselves or from other members of the integrated bar, by the vote of at least five governors. Each of the regional members of the board shall be ex-official vice president for the region which he represents. 
The President and Executive Vice President shall hold office for a term of one year from the date of their election and until their successors shall have duly qualified. The Executive Vice President shall automatically become the President for the next succeeding full term. The Presidency shall rotate from year to year among all the nine regions in such order of rotation as the Board of Governors shall prescribe. No person shall be President or Executive Vice President of the Integrated Bar for more than one term. The Integrated Bar shall have a Secretary, a Treasurer, and such other officers and employees as may be required by the Board of Governors to be appointed by the President with the consent of the Board and to hold office at the pleasure of the Board or for such term as it may fix. Said officers and employees need not be members of the Integrated Bar. Section 8. In the event the President is absent or unable to act, his duties shall be performed by the Executive Vice President, and in the event of the death, resignation, or removal of the President, the Executive Vice President shall serve as Acting President during the remainder of the term of the office thus vacated. In the event of the death, resignation, removal or disability of both the President and the Executive Vice President, the Board of Governors shall elect an Acting President to hold office until the next succeeding election or during the period of disability. The filling of vacancies in the House of Delegates, Board of Governors, and all other positions of officers of the Integrated Bar shall be as provided in the bylaws. Whenever the term of an office or position is for a fixed period, the person chosen to fill a vacancy therein shall serve only for the unexpired term. Section 9. Every member of the Integrated Bar shall pay such annual dues as the Board of Governors shall determine with the approval of the Supreme Court. A fixed sum equivalent to 10% of the collections from each chapter shall be set aside as a welfare fund for disabled members of the chapter and the compulsory heirs of deceased members thereof. Section 10. Subject to the provisions of Section 12 of this rule, default in the payment of annual dues for six months shall warrant suspension of membership in the integrated bar, and default in such payment for one year shall be a ground for the removal of the name of a delinquent member from the role of attorneys. Section 11. A member may terminate his membership by filing a written notice to that effect with the Secretary of the Integrated Bar, who shall immediately bring the matter to the attention of the Supreme Court. Forthwith, he shall cease to be a member, and his name shall be stricken by the court from the role of attorneys. Reinstatement may be made by the court in accordance with rules and regulations prescribed by the Board of Governors and approved by the court. Section 12. The Board of Governors shall provide in the bylaws for grievance procedures for the enforcement and maintenance of discipline among all the members of the integrated bar, but no action involving the suspension or disbarment of a member or the removal of his name from the role of attorneys shall be effective without the final approval of the Supreme Court. Section 13. The integrated bar shall be strictly non-political and every activity tending to impair this basic feature is strictly prohibited and shall be penalized accordingly. No lawyer holding an elective, judicial, quasi-judicial, or prosecutory office in the government or any political subdivision or instrumentality thereof shall be eligible for election or appointment to any position in the integrated bar or any chapter thereof. A delegate, governor, officer or employee of the integrated bar or an officer or employee of any chapter thereof shall be considered ipso facto resigned from his position as of the moment he files his certificate of candidacy for any elective public office or accepts appointment to any judicial, quasi-judicial or prosecutory office in the government or any political subdivision or instrumentality thereof. Section 14 Except as may be specifically authorized or allowed by the Supreme Court, no delegate or governor, and no national or local official or committee member shall receive any compensation, allowance, or emolument from the funds of the integrated bar for any service rendered therein, or be entitled to reimbursement 
for any expense incurred in the discharge of his functions. Section 15. The Board of Governors shall administer the funds of the integrated bar and shall have the power to make appropriations and disbursements therefrom. It shall cause proper books of accounts to be kept and financial statements to be rendered and shall see to it that the proper audit is made of all accounts of the integrated bar and all the chapters thereof. Section 16. The Board of Governors shall cause to be published a quarterly journal of the integrated bar, free copies of which shall be distributed to every member of the integrated bar. Section 17. All voluntary bar associations now existing, or which may hereafter be formed, may coexist with the integrated bar, but shall not operate at cross-purposes therewith. Section 18. This rule may be amended by the Supreme Court, motu proprio, or upon the recommendation of the Board of Governors or any chapter of the integrated bar. Section 19. The Commission on Bar Integration shall organize the local chapters, and towards this end shall secure the assistance of the Department of Justice and of all judges throughout the Philippines. All chapter organizational meetings shall be held on Saturday, February 17, 1973. In every case, the Commission shall cause proper notice of the date, time and place of the meeting to be served upon all the lawyers concerned at their addresses appearing in the records of the Commission. The lawyers present at the meeting called to organize a chapter shall constitute a quorum for the purpose, including the election of a president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, and five directors. The Commission shall initially fix the number of delegates and apportion the same among all the chapters, as nearly as may be in proportion to the number of their respective members. But each chapter shall have at least one delegate. The president of each chapter shall concurrently be its delegate to the House of Delegates. The vice president shall be his alternate, except where the chapter is entitled to have more than one delegate in which case, the vice president shall also be a delegate. The board of directors of the chapter shall, in proper cases, elect additional as well as alternate delegates. The House of Delegates shall convene in the city of Manila on Saturday, March 17, 1973, for the purpose of electing a board of governors. The governors shall immediately assume office and forthwith meet to elect the officers of the integrated bar. The officers so chosen shall immediately assume their respective positions. Section 20. This rule shall take effect on January 16, 1973. Rule 139b. Disbarment and Discipline of Attorneys. Section 1. Proceedings for disbarment, suspension, or discipline of attorneys may be taken by the Supreme Court motu proprio or by the Integrated Bar of the Philippines or IBP upon the verified complaint of any person. The complaint shall state clearly and concisely the facts complained of, and shall be supported by affidavits or persons having personal knowledge of the facts therein, alleged and or by such documents as may substantiate said facts. The IBP Board of Governors may motu proprio or upon referral by the Supreme Court or by a chapter Board of Officers, or at the instance of any person, initiate and prosecute proper charges against any erring attorney, including those in the government service. Provided, however, that all charges against Justices of the Court of Appeals and the Sandigan Bayan, and Judges of the Court of Tax Appeals and lower courts, even if lawyers are jointly charged with them, shall be filed with the Supreme Court. Provided further, that charges filed against justices and judges before the IBP, including those filed prior to their appointment in the judiciary, shall immediately be forwarded to the Supreme Court for disposition and adjudication. Six copies of the verified complaint shall be filed with the secretary of the IBP or the secretary of any of its chapters who shall forthwith transmit the same to the IBP Board of Governors for assignment to an investigator. Section 2. The Board of Governors shall appoint from among IBP members an investigator 
or when special circumstances so warrant, a panel of three investigators to investigate the complaint. All investigators shall take an oath of office in the form prescribed by the Board of Governors. A copy of the investigator's appointment and oath shall be transmitted to the Supreme Court. An investigator may be disqualified by reason of relationship within the fourth degree of consanguinity or affinity to any of the parties or their counsel, pecuniary interest, personal bias, or his having acted as counsel for either party, unless the parties sign and enter upon the record of their written consent to his acting as such investigator. Where the investigator does not disqualify himself, a party may appeal to the IBP Board of Governors, which by majority vote of the members present, there being a quorum, may order his disqualification. Any investigator may also be removed for cause, after due hearing, by the vote of at least six members of the IBP Board of Governors. The decision of the Board of Governors in all cases of disqualification or removal shall be final. Section 3. The National Grievance Investigators shall investigate all complaints against members of the Integrated Bar, referred to them by the IBP Board of Governors. Section 4. The proper IBP chapter may assist the complainants in the preparation and filing of his complaints. Section 5. If the complaint appears to be meritorious, the investigator shall direct that a copy thereof be served upon the respondent, requiring him to answer the same within 15 days from the date of service. If the complaint does not merit action, or if the answer shows to the satisfaction of the investigator that the complaint is not meritorious, the same may be dismissed by the Board of Governors upon his recommendation. A copy of the resolution of dismissal shall be furnished the complainant and the Supreme Court, which may review the case motu proprio, or upon timely appeal of the complainant filed within 15 days from notice of the dismissal of the complaint. No investigation shall be interrupted or terminated by reason of the desistance, settlement, compromise, restitution, withdrawal of charges, or failure of the complainant to prosecute the same. Section 6. The answer shall be verified. The original and five legible copies of the answer shall be filed with the investigator with proof of service of a copy thereof on the complainant or his counsel. Section 7. The IBP Board of Governors shall appoint a suitable member of the integrated bar as counsel to assist the complainant or the respondent during the investigation in case of need for such assistance. Section 8. Upon joinder of issues, or upon failure of the respondent to answer, the investigator shall, with deliberate speed, Proceed with the investigation of the case. He shall have the power to issue subpoenas and administer oaths. The respondent shall be given full opportunity to defend himself, to present witnesses on his behalf, and be heard by himself in counsel. However, if upon reasonable notice the respondent fails to appear, the investigation shall proceed ex parte. The investigator shall terminate the investigation within three months from the date of its commencement unless extended for good cause by the Board of Governors upon prior application. Willful failure or refusal to obey a subpoena or any other lawful order issued by the investigator shall be dealt with as for indirect contempt of court. The corresponding charge shall be filed by the investigator before the IBP Board of Governors, which shall require the alleged contemner to show cause within 10 days from notice. The IBP Board of Governors may thereafter conduct hearings, if necessary, in accordance with the procedures set forth in this rule for hearings before the investigator. Such hearing shall, as far as practicable, be terminated within 15 days from its commencement. Thereafter, the IBP Board of Governors shall, within a like period of 15 days, issue a resolution setting forth its findings and recommendations, which shall forthwith be transmitted to the Supreme Court for final action, and if warranted, the imposition of penalty. Section 9. Depositions may be taken in accordance with the rules of court, with leave of the investigators. Within the Philippines, depositions may be taken before any member of the Board of Governors, the President of any chapter, or any officer authorized by law to administer oaths. 
Depositions may be taken outside the Philippines before a diplomatic or consular representative of the Philippine government or before any person agreed upon by the parties or designated by the Board of Governors. Any suitable member of the integrated bar in the place where a deposition shall be taken may be designated by the investigator to assist the complainant or the respondent in taking a deposition. Section 10. Not later than 30 days from the termination of the investigation, the investigator shall submit a report containing his findings of fact and recommendations to the IBP Board of Governors, together with the stenographic notes and the transcript thereof, and all the evidence presented during the investigation. The submission of the report need not await the transcription of the stenographic notes, it being sufficient that the report reproduce substantially, from the investigator's personal notes, any relevant and pertinent testimonies. Section 11. No defect in a complaint, notice, answer, or in the proceeding, or the investigator's report shall be considered as substantial, unless the Board of Governors, upon considering the whole record, finds that such defect has resulted or may result in a miscarriage of justice, in which event the Board shall take such remedial action as the circumstances may warrant, including invalidation of the entire proceedings. Section 12. Paragraph A. Every case heard by an investigator shall be reviewed by the IBP Board of Governors upon the record and evidence transmitted to it by the investigator with his report. The decision of the Board upon such review shall be in writing, and shall clearly and distinctly state the facts and the reasons on which it is based. It shall be promulgated within a period not exceeding 30 days from the next meeting of the Board, following the submittal of the investigator's report. Paragraph B. If the Board, by the vote of a majority of its total membership, determines that the respondent should be suspended from the practice of law, or disbarred, it shall issue a resolution setting forth its findings and recommendations which, together with the whole record of the case, shall forthwith be transmitted to the Supreme Court for final action. Paragraph C. If the respondent is exonerated by the board or the disciplinary sanction imposed by it is less than suspension or disbarment, such as admonition, reprimand, or fine, it shall issue a decision exonerating respondent or imposing such sanction. The case shall be deemed terminated unless upon petition of the complainant or other interested party filed with the Supreme Court within 15 days from notice of the Board's resolution, the Supreme Court orders otherwise. Paragraph D. Notice of the resolution or decision of the Board shall be given to all parties through their counsel. A copy of the same shall be transmitted to the Supreme Court. Section 13. In proceedings initiated motu proprio by the Supreme Court or in other proceedings when the interest of justice so requires, the Supreme Court may refer the case for investigation to the Solicitor General or to any officer of the Supreme Court or judge of a lower court, in which case the investigation shall proceed in the same manner provided in sections 6 to 11 hereof, save that the review of the report of investigation shall be conducted directly by the Supreme Court. Section 14. Based upon the evidence adduced at the investigation, the Solicitor General or other investigator designated by the Supreme Court shall submit to the Supreme Court a report containing his findings of fact and recommendations together with a record and all the evidences presented in the investigation for the final action of the Supreme Court. Section 15. After receipt of respondent's answer or lapse of the period therefore, the Supreme Court, motu proprio, or at the instance of the IBP Board of Governors upon the recommendation of the investigators, may suspend an attorney from the practice of his profession for any of the causes specified in Rule 138, Section 27, during the pendency of the investigation until such suspension is lifted by the Supreme Court. Section 16. The Court of Appeals or Regional Trial Court may suspend an attorney from practice for any of the causes named in Rule 138, Section 27, until further action of the Supreme Court in the case. Section 17. Upon such suspension, 
the Court of Appeals or a regional trial court shall forthwith transmit to the Supreme Court a certified copy of the order of suspension and a full statement of the facts upon which the same was based. Upon receipt of such certified copy and statement, the Supreme Court shall make a full investigation of the case and may revoke, shorten, or extend the suspension or disbar the attorney as the facts may warrant. Section 18. Proceedings against attorneys shall be private and confidential. However, the final order of the Supreme Court shall be published like its decisions in other cases. Section 19. All reasonable and necessary expenses incurred in relation to disciplinary and disbarment proceedings are lawful charges for which the parties may be taxed as costs. Section 20. This rule shall take effect on June 1, 1988. All cases pending investigation by the Office of the Solicitor General shall be transferred to the Integrated Bar of the Philippines Board of Governors for investigation and disposition, as provided in this rule, except those cases where the investigation has been substantially completed. Rule 140 Discipline of judges of regular and special courts and justices of the Court of Appeals and the Sandigan Bayan. Section 1. Proceedings for the discipline of judges of regular and special courts and justices of the Court of Appeals and the Sandigan Bayan may be instituted motu proprio by the Supreme Court or upon a verified complaint, supported by affidavits of persons who have personal knowledge of the facts alleged therein, or by documents which may substantiate such allegations, or upon an anonymous complaint, supported by public records of undubitable integrity. The complaint shall be in writing, and shall state clearly and concisely the acts and omissions constituting violations of standards of conduct prescribed for judges by law, the rules of court, or the code of judicial conduct. Section 2. If the complaint is sufficient in form and substance, a copy thereof shall be served upon the respondent, and he shall be required to comment within 10 days from the date of service. Otherwise, the same shall be dismissed. Section 3. Upon the filing of the respondent's comment, or upon the expiration of the time for filing the same, and unless other pleadings or documents are required, the court shall refer the matter to the Office of the Court Administrator for evaluation, report, and recommendation or assign the case for investigation, report, and recommendation to a retired member of the Supreme Court. If the respondent is a justice of the Court of Appeals and the Sandigan Bayan, or to a justice of the Court of Appeals if the respondent is a judge of a regional trial court or of a special court of equivalent rank, or to a judge of the regional trial court if the respondent is a judge of an inferior court. Section 4. The investigating justice or judge shall set a day for the hearing and send notice thereof to both parties. At such hearing, the parties may present oral and documentary evidence. If, after due notice, the respondent fails to appear, the investigation shall proceed ex parte. The investigating justice or judge shall terminate the investigation within 90 days from the date of its commencement or within such extension as the Supreme Court may grant. Section 5. Within 30 days from the termination of the investigation, the investigating justice or judge shall submit to the Supreme Court a report containing findings of fact and recommendation. The report shall be accompanied by the record containing the evidence and the pleadings filed by the parties. The report shall be confidential and shall be for the exclusive use of the court. Section 6. The court shall take such action on the report as the facts and the law may warrant. Section 7. Administrative charges are classified as serious, less serious, or light. Section 8. Serious charges include Number 1. Bribery, direct or indirect. Number two, dishonesty in violations of the Anti Graft and Corrupt Practices Law. Number three, gross misconduct constituting violations of the Code of Judicial Conduct. Number four, 
knowingly rendering an unjust judgment or order as determined by a competent court in an appropriate proceeding. Number five, conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude. Number six, willful failure to pay a just debt. Number seven, borrowing money or property from lawyers and litigants in a case pending before the court. Number eight, immorality. Number nine, gross ignorance of the law or procedure. Number ten, partisan political activities. And number eleven, alcoholism and or vicious habits. Section nine, less serious charges include Number one, undue delay in rendering a decision or order or in transmitting the records of a case. Number two, frequent and unjustified absences without leave or habitual tardiness. Number three, unauthorized practice of law. Number four, violation of Supreme Court rules, directives, and circulars. Number five, Receiving additional or double compensation unless specifically authorized by law. Number six, untruthful statements in the certificate of service. And number seven, simple misconduct. Section 10, light charges include Number one, vulgar and unbecoming conduct. Number two, gambling in public. Number three, fraternizing with lawyers and litigants with pending case or cases in his court. And, number four, undue delay in the submission of monthly reports. Section 11. If the respondent is guilty of a serious charge, any of the following sanctions may be imposed. Number one, dismissal from the service, forfeiture of all or part of the benefits as the court may determine and disqualification from reinstatement or appointment to any public office, including government-owned or controlled corporations, provided, however, that the forfeiture of benefits shall in no case include accrued leave credits. Number 2. Suspension from office without salary and other benefits for more than 3 but not exceeding 6 months. Or, number 3. A fine of more than 20,000 pesos but not exceeding 40,000 pesos. If the respondent is guilty of a less serious charge, any of the following sanctions shall be imposed. Number 1. Suspension from office without salary and other benefits for not less than 1 nor more than 3 months. Or, number 2. A fine of more than 10,000 pesos, but not exceeding 20,000 pesos. If the respondent is guilty of a light charge, any of the following sanctions shall be imposed. Number 1. A fine of not less than 1,000 pesos but not exceeding 10,000 pesos. And or number 2. Censure. Number 3. Reprimand. Number 4. Admonition with warning. Section 12. Proceedings against judges of regular and special courts and justices of the Court of Appeals and the Sandigan Bayan shall be private and confidential, but a copy of the decision or resolution of the court shall be attached to the record of the respondent in the office of the court administrator. Rule 141. Legal Fees Rule 142. Costs Section 1. Unless otherwise provided in these rules, costs shall be allowed to the prevailing party as a matter of course, but the court shall have power for special reasons, a judge that either party shall pay the costs of an action, or that the same be divided as may be equitable. No costs shall be allowed against the Republic of the Philippines unless otherwise provided by law. Section 2. If an action or appeal is dismissed, for want of jurisdiction or otherwise, the court nevertheless shall have the power to render judgment for costs as justice may require. Section 3. Where an action or an appeal is found to be frivolous, double or treble costs may be imposed on the plaintiff or appellant, 
which shall be paid by his attorney, if so ordered by the court. Section 4. An averment in a pleading made without reasonable cause, and found untrue, shall subject the offending party to the payment of such reasonable expenses as may have been necessarily incurred by the other party, by reason of such untrue pleading. The amount of expenses so payable shall be fixed by the judge in the trial, and taxed as costs. Section 5. When the record contains any unnecessary, irrelevant, or immaterial matter, the party at whose instance the same was inserted, or at whose instance the same was printed, shall not be allowed as costs any disbursement for preparing, certifying, or printing such matter. Section 6. No attorney's fees shall be taxed as costs against the adverse party, except as provided by the rules of civil law. But this section shall have no relation to the fees to be charged by an attorney as against his client. Section 7. If the plaintiff in any action shall recover a sum not exceeding 10 pesos as debt or damages, he shall recover no more costs than debt or damages unless the court shall certify that the action involved a substantial and important right to the plaintiff, in which case full costs may be allowed. Section 8. In inferior courts, the costs shall be taxed by the justice of the peace or municipal judge and included in the judgment. In superior courts, costs shall be taxed by the clerk of the corresponding court on five days' written notice given by the prevailing party to the adverse party. When this notice shall be served, a statement of the items of costs claimed by the prevailing party, verified by his oath or that of his attorney. Objections to that taxation shall be made in writing, specifying the items objected to. Either party may appeal to the court from the clerk's taxation. The costs shall be inserted in the judgment if taxed before its entry and payment thereof shall be enforced by its execution. Section 9. In an action or proceeding pending before a justice of the peace or municipal judge, the prevailing party may recover the following costs and no other. Paragraph A. For the complaint or answer, 2 pesos. Paragraph B. For the attendance of himself or his counsel or both on the day of trial, 5 pesos. Paragraph C. For each additional day's attendance required in the actual trial of the case, 1 peso. Paragraph D. For each witness produced by him for each day's necessary attendance at the trial, 1 peso. And his lawful traveling fees. Paragraph E. For each deposition lawfully taken by him and produced in evidence, 5 pesos. Paragraph F. For original documents, deeds, or papers of any kind produced by him, nothing. Paragraph G. For official copies of such documents, deeds, or papers, the lawful fees necessarily paid for obtaining such copies. Paragraph H. The lawful fees paid by him for service of the summons and other process in the action. Paragraph I. The lawful fees charged against him by the judge of the court in entering and docketing and trying the action or proceeding. Section 10. In an action or proceeding, pending in a court of first instance, the prevailing party may recover the following costs and no other. Paragraph A. For the complaint or answer, 15 pesos. Paragraph B. For his own attendance and that of his attorney, down to and including final judgment, 20 pesos. Paragraph C. For each witness necessarily produced by him for each day's necessary attendance of such witness at the trial, 2 pesos, and his lawful traveling fees. Paragraph D. For each deposition lawfully taken by him and produced in evidence, 5 pesos. Paragraph E. For original documents, deeds or papers of any kind produced by him, nothing. Paragraph F. For official copies of such documents, deeds, or papers, the lawful fees necessarily paid for obtaining such copies. Paragraph G. 
the lawful fees paid by him in entering and docketing the action or recording the proceedings for the service of any process in action and all lawful clerk's fees paid by him. Section 11. In an action or proceeding pending in the Court of Appeals or in the Supreme Court, the prevailing party may recover the following costs and no other. Paragraph A. For his own attendance and that of his attorney, down to and including final judgment, 30 pesos in the Court of Appeals and 50 pesos in the Supreme Court. Paragraph B. For official copies of record on appeal and the printing thereof, and all other copies required by the rules of court, the sum actually paid for the same. Paragraph C. All lawful fees charged against him by the clerk of the Court of Appeals or of the Supreme Court in entering and docketing the action and recording the proceedings and judgment therein and for the issuing of all process. Paragraph D. No allowance shall be made to the prevailing party in the Supreme Court or Court of Appeals for the brief or written or printed arguments of his attorney, or copies thereof, aside from the 30 or 50 pesos above stated. Paragraph E. If testimony is received in the Supreme Court or Court of Appeals not taken in another court and transmitted thereto, the prevailing party shall be allowed the same costs for witness fees, depositions, and process and service thereof, as he would have been allowed for such items had the testimony been introduced in a court of first instance. Paragraph F. The lawful fees of a commissioner in an action may also be taxed against the defeated party or apportioned as justice requires. Section 12. If a witness fails to appear at the time and place specified in the subpoena issued by any inferior court, the costs of the warrant of arrest and of the arrest of the witness shall be paid by the witness if the court shall determine that his failure to answer the subpoena was willful or without just cause. Section 13. When a person is cited on motion of another to appear before the court to be examined in probate proceedings, the court may, in its discretion, tax costs for the person so cited and issue execution therefore allowing the same fees as for witnesses in courts of first instance. Rule 143. Applicability of the Rules These rules shall not apply to land registration, cadastral and election cases, naturalization and insolvency proceedings, and other cases not herein provided for, except by analogy or in a supplementary character, and whenever practicable and convenient. Rule 144. Effectiveness. These rules shall take effect on January 1, 1964. They shall govern all cases brought after they take effect, and also all further proceedings in cases then pending, except to the extent that in the opinion of the court, their application would not be feasible or would work injustice, in which event the former procedure shall apply.